Are there any questions? What's the schedule for next week? What? What is the schedule for next week? Oh, that's a great question. Um, let us say that it's uh, just, well, let me ask you, uh, we could do Monday or we could do Wednesday. Um, which would you prefer? Is it required that we vote on one or the other? Huh? Is none an option? Is what? Is none an option? Well, I guess you could have not an option. Well, maybe Monday. Yeah, Monday would be good. I suppose Monday does make more sense because some people are leaving for winter vacation. Um, all right, uh, let's say Monday at 5.30. Um, if there's a... Uh, hello. Hi. If there's um, a... Uh, if, if there's a room conflict, I'll send you an email. Um, so we were talking about path intervals last time, and I want to continue that. And um, uh, so I let me get back to where I was in the notes here. Okay. We had basically shown that um, the uh, pattern interval reproduces uh, classical physics, but it also and it also reproduces the Schrodinger equation. So um, we feel pretty good about it. It turns out that the, 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 the two formulations of quantum field theory. There is the um, canonical formulation with annihilation creation operators, which we followed up until uh, Wednesday of last week. And then there's the path integral formulation. Um, they're very different formulations. Um, each one, they're, they're essentially equivalent, uh, but they're good for different things. Uh, the canonical formulation it's very good for doing some problems. The path integral formulation is very good for doing other problems. Um, uh, it's a little hard for me to generalize and say what's what's what, but obviously the connection to classical physics is clearer in the path integral formulation than in the annihilation and creation canonical formulation. Um, it's also true that symmetries are, and things related to symmetry, are more apparent in the path integral formulation because the path integral formulation, at least um, usually, we hope in most cases, eventually gets expressed in terms of an action or a space-time integral of a Lagrange density. And the Lagrange density is the thing that has all the symmetries of the theory. Whereas the Hamiltonian has some of the symmetries, but it's the time component of a, uh, of a uh, four vector, uh, because it's energy. And um, so it, it doesn't express, it doesn't have Lorentz invariants. It doesn't include Lorentz invariants in an obvious way. Okay, so there are these um, relative advantages and disadvantages. Um, let me now show you uh, the path integral for a free particle. Um, there are two words. I completely agree with you, but it's just not me, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> then he's agreeing with me. Huh? All right. I think so what we're talking about now is a path into, is, is uh, time goes by, we have a certain interval, and we're talking about a particle going from q equal to zero to some uh, q 
vector up here, and of course, the classical path. The classical path, at least non relativistically, is a straight line, and um, the classical path, in fact, is uh, Q classical of T prime is just Q vector times T prime over T. Then T prime equal to zero, it's zero. T prime equal to T, it's Q. And um, the speed is constant. Consequently, the acceleration is zero. And then so we're satisfying Newton's equation, which is the acceleration proportional to force. There's no force because it's a free particle. Okay, so um, what, what do we expect then? Well, we expect then that the amplitude q e to the minus i t h q equal to zero um, is well, we know that we, we expect, first of all, that it's going to be an integral, e to the i s um, 0 of q dt, and it's going to be that path integral. On the other hand, this s0 we can write explicitly with e to the i integral m over 2 q dot squared of t prime dt prime from 0 to t. Q. So that's, that's the formulation in terms of um, path integrals. On the other hand, as I said, we know there's a classical path. We know it's stationary. And consequently, and in fact, the stationarity is sort of obvious because um, uh, M integral Q classical dot dotted into the um, change in the derivative, which is d delta q dt uh, dt. They, what do they use as t? Do they use capital t? So this is really t. Um, well, q dot is a constant. And so this is m q classical dot dotted into the integral of d variation of q dt prime, let us say, dt prime, this is just m q classical dot dotted into the change in q at t minus the change in q at zero. But these are both zero. This is zero and that's zero. So we just have zero minus zero. So the thing is, it's sort of super stationary. Um, and so we can write this path integral as 0 of q, which is then m over 2 integral q classical of t prime plus delta q of t prime dot squared dt prime. This is then the first term, which is um, m over 2 integral q classical dot of t prime dt prime squared. This is just a classical action. And um, we can compute what that, what that is. I guess I should follow my notes rather than jump around. The next term is the time integral of the dot product of these two. And we've just seen that that's 0. And so the third term is third term is m over 2 integral 0 to t change in q dot t prime dt prime. Okay, so if we substitute that in here, what we see is that um, this thing is just a number. So this is e to the i m over 2 integral q classical dot squared of t prime dt prime. And then what remains is a path integral 
which is uh, e to the i m over 2. Again, my left hand is down. I shouldn't do that. Um, it's m over, well, it's still down, isn't it? 0 to t delta q dot squared of t prime to t prime. OK. And it's not plus. Yeah, it is. No, it's times. Okay, um, the plus occurs in the action, so the exponential is not this. Okay. Now, uh, what's this? Well, this is very simple. It's just the integral. So this is S0 of Q classical. This is then M over 2, integral 0 to T, Q classical dot squared. Well, the dot squared just gives you Q squared over t prime squared, no, t squared, dt prime, and so that is m q vector squared over 2t. And on the other hand, this thing, oh, I forgot the d delta q, since we're just integrating over delta q there. Now this thing, this whole path integral has no reference to q0, to q at 0, or q of t. So it's just a function of t and a course of m of 2 and of i and uh, perhaps some other complex numbers. But it's not, it doesn't involve uh, q vector, the end point, or the initial point. Q0. If I had gone from Q1 to Q2, it would be independent of both of them because it's an integral, pan-integral over loops. Okay. So what we've got then is that this is e to the i mq vector squared over 2t times some function of t, which is a path integral over loops, so I call that just L of t. Okay. But on the other hand, we know that in the limit t goes to 0, this is Dirac's delta function of q. Okay. So this thing has to become Dirac's delta function of q as we let t go to 0. It's just amazing how often Dirac is is helping us out. Um, I mean, it's it's like it's as though Dirac is a cruise ship, and we're sort of passengers, sort of sunning ourselves on the deck and walking around, maybe hanging up laundry to dry. But um, we're not running the boat. We're taking advantage of all these things Dirac did. It's really quite amazing. Okay, well, one of the many forms of the Dirac delta function is a limit t goes to zero of m over 2 pi i h bar t to the 3 halves um, e to the i m Q squared over 2 h bar t. And in fact, that's, um, that's actually essentially the whole expression we have. And so the point is then that L of t, I somehow have an n here. So I didn't bring up a given pen. So L of t is uh, simply m over 2 pi i t to the 3 halves. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and so we have then that um, well, with the path integral 
uh, formulation gives us Q e to the minus i h t. Um, and if I put in all the units, zero is m over 2 pi i h bar t 3 halves i e to the i n q squared over 2 h bar t. Okay. So, um, and you can verify this. One way of verifying is the Hamiltonian here is p squared over 2 and you can sort of complete set of p states to the, uh, yeah, it's effectively a, uh, I guess an imaginary Gaussian integral. You do the integration and uh, get the right hand side. Um, so, what this tells us once again is that if you're dealing with a problem and you're computing an amplitude for which there's a classical solution, then the path integral is the exponential of i times the classical action of the station of the classical solution times some function of time. That's uh, very, very general. Um, okay, now just to illustrate um, as an example of the utility of um, path integrals, let's, let's look at the bohm aharonov effect, which um, in terms of path integrals, I think it's, it's, it's just very much simpler. Um, what we're going to be looking for then is um, what the, uh, the action is for these various uh, paths. And so the idea here is that we're sending some particles either this way or that way around a magnetic field that's pointing out of the board. And um, we can imagine that the magnetic field is confined to a, um, a small cylinder, say. And the cylinder is surrounded by mu metal or something that prevents magnetic fields from penetrating. Um, now, what's the classical action for a charged particle moving in an electromagnetic field? Well, it's a rather nice expression. It's an integral, say, from x1 to x2. Uh, one half m v dot dx, that's the kinetic part, and then q um, a of x of t, and well, and t, if there is a t, um, dotted into dx, or equivalently, if you want, it's the integral of one half m v plus q a uh, dot q x. All right, so this is um, what the action is. And now let's, let's imagine uh, for simplicity that these are two classical paths. The fact that they curve a little bit, let's not worry about the fact that they curve. Um, so apart from the curving a little bit, um, uh, we can compute the classical action, and in particular, we can compute the difference in the two amplitudes here. It's the difference of the amplitudes that will cause some uh, interference. Or to put it differently, it'll be one amplitude, well, let, let, let's, let's just see what the probability is forgetting at some point y there. Uh, well, actually, that point is x2, isn't it? So probability of x2 is absolute value of one uh, amplitude, x2 um, e to the minus i, th, and so forth, uh, x1, um, along one path, plus the same thing, x2 e to the minus i, th, 
x1 other paths say squared. And what, what we've learned from the free particle is that this thing is essentially e to the i s1 plus e to the i s2 times uh, loop functions of time. But um, since the time is the same, they can uh, factor out. So we'll have L, L, that's the value squared. And so this is going to be L squared. Um, well, it's e to the i s1 plus e to the i s2, e to the minus i s1 plus e to the minus i s2. And so this is L squared uh, 1 plus 1 uh, plus uh, 2 cosine of um, S1 minus S2. And so we expect a, an interference pattern involving the uh, difference of the two S's. Well, the difference of the two S's over uh, Planck's constant, well, over h bar, is effectively the, in other words, one minus the other is, you can imagine that we went this way and then back. So it's an integral around the magnetic field. So it's m v over 2 plus q a dot dx over h bar. And so this is some um, mv over 2 dx over h bar. And this is just some number that depends upon the geometry of the experiment. But then there's another term, which is the integral of um, q a dot dx over h bar. And you know one of the high points of electromagnetic, elementary electromagnetic theory is that the integral of A around a closed loop is the integral of the curl of A over some surface bounded by the loop. And, that, and the curl of A causes the magnetic field B. And so it's the integral of the flux uh, through the loop. Let me give you something to put some glucose in your bloodstream. Whoops! Okay. Um, okay, so what is this? This thing is an integral mv over 2 dot dx over h bar plus q over h bar, the integral of b dot d sigma say where this is the integral over the area enclosed by the loop, and b is zero everywhere except inside the mu metal here. And so this is what we call the flux. And so this is this term plus q times the flux divided by h bar, where this is the magnetic flux through the cylinder. And in fact, this has been observed. Uh, Bowman and Haranoff suggested it. Um, a long time ago. And when they first did suggest it, it, well, it caused a great deal of puzzle in the physical community because people were saying, well, there's no magnetic field here. There's no electric field here. There can't be any effect. And uh, so they were saying that Bohm and Haranoff were just being, being silly. And, um, but, People eventually did, the, did, did these kinds of experiments and uh, found out the figure fact, right? Yes. So what you wrote there was the probability, right, of the probability of being an x2, the expression down there. Yeah. And then what you solved was just the delta s, and you showed that the delta s was not zero, right? That was the right. That was the right. right. Not only, oh, well, good. But so right. Right. point. First of all, I left out the h bar. Okay. But the second thing is that, of course, the way in which you see the effect yeah. Is you vary the field, you jack up and, oh. and turn down the magnetic field, and so you see this cosine thing changing. Okay. 
And in fact, not only that, but you can see what the what the you know space should be between um, what the phase difference should be, and so. Uh, um, Right. So, for a given position, the probability should should go through minima and maxima as you vary the flux. And um, in particular, um, you would have maxima when um, this is a cosine, after all. So the cosine is maximum for zero and two pi, and it's minimum. It's a minimum for pi. And so the probability would be maximum when q phi over h bar was equal to 2 pi n. So they found that, uh, they verified this where q is the charge of the particle. Good question. I, I, I think I didn't. Good catch, good catch. Yes. If I don't teach you anything, I'll teach you at least how to catch <laughs> badly fit pieces of the sacks of <laughs> yeah. All right, um, questions? By the way, Feynman, I think I told you this, but and I wasn't there, but I heard this as a story, and I think it's reliable. He one year decided that he was going to he was assigned to teach quantum mechanics, so he was going to teach everything in terms of path integrals. And after about two weeks, he said, well, path integrals are great for some things, but not for everything. So he went back to the standard way of doing quantum mechanics. And that's the, case, that's the nature of path integrals. They're very good for some things, not so good for other things. And um, so you really need both approaches. Um, <coughs> Okay, well, remember we're talk we've been talking about uh, to do quantum mechanics, we do path integrals like this. To do uh, statistical mechanics, uh, thermodynamics, and so forth, physics at finite temperature, we do um, path integrals in imaginary time. In other words, instead of just computing e to the minus ith, we just compute e to the minus beta h. And so let's do that now for the case of a free particle. Well, in this case, uh, what do we get? We get that the, um, let us say, q e to the minus beta h, 0. Well, what will this be as a path integral? Um, I, this is essentially. Um, e to the minus beta integral of um, m over 2 uh, q dot squared dt, but there's no i, and we're doing a dq. Okay? All right. Now, um, what, let's, let's try to take advantage of the fact that this action is quadratic. So the first thing we do is we find a q classical, and it's not really a classical in the ordinary sense, it's a Q, a Q thermal classical, or classically thermal. Anyway, the Q that minimizes this, but that goes at zero at, at time zero, and is Q at uh, time beta. Okay. Well, once again, it's obvious that this path is Q of uh, t is equal to q vector over, well, of t prime is q over t times t prime. It's just a straight line because it has to go from one to the other. And the way you see that is that you, you, you ins insist that it be stationary and that's the minimum. Okay. So then um, we compute this, this action. And of course, it's essentially the same thing as what I got there. It's that you get the q then e to the minus beta h 0 
must be e to the minus m over 2. Well, let's see. What's the action of this path? The action of this path is beta m over 2 q vector squared uh, over t. Right? Okay. So what we get um, when we put in the units here is e to the minus m over 2 q vector squared over beta but then there's an h bar squared here actually. Um, so okay. so there's an h bar squared there and then there's some L of beta because there's a loop integral that one has to do. But the loop integral again only depends upon uh, in this case beta, in the other case it was t. And once again Dirac, Dirac um, we're after all on this cruise ship Dirac um, and uh, somebody blows a whistle or something and out pops a delta function. And so what we want, what, what L has to be is what well, we make this a delta function when beta in the limit of um, uh, beta going to, what is it, beta going to what? Let me just make sure. Yeah, beta going to zero. So it's just, this is just the identity operator. And uh, what does it is simply this. It's simple, so closely related to what we had there, but it's m over 2 pi h bar squared beta to the 3 halves. That's basically the loop integral. And then we have e to the minus m to the vector squared over uh, 2 h bar squared. Yeah. All right. So that's um, so that's the free particle. Now, of course, what we have in quantum mechanics as um, nice, simple systems is the free particle, the harmonic oscillator in one do, in, uh, in one dimension or in any dimensions, and um, we make very heavy use of the harmonic oscillator, as you know. In fact, uh, Schwartz's view is that quantum field theory is just harmonic oscillators uh, run riot. Um, so we're going to go to the harmonic oscillator, um, which is basically the mouse of quantum mechanics. I'm referring to biology, where the biologists just use mice for everything almost. Um, very hard to be a mouse at NIH. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, what's H? It's um, P squared over 2M plus uh, M omega squared P squared over 2. So that's our, our Hamiltonian. And now um, I'm going to be in real time at first. And so we have here Q double prime e to the minus i th, I'm sitting h bar into the zero temporarily, um, and we'll say, well, this is a path integral on e to the i s of q dq. So we're integrating over all paths that go from q prime to q double prime in time t. So what's uh, s? Well, of course, s here is the integral of the uh, Lagrangian, 0 to t, 1 half m q dot squared of t prime minus a half m omega squared q squared of t prime q t prime. Let me just mention one thing that I, um, I went through very rapidly, but um, I think I ought to underline. It's an x here. And this x is what? It's the same as this x. Okay? It's the x of the, of the particle. And in quantum mechanics, this x is uh, an operator. And here, um, of course, in, in, in uh, path integral land, uh, 
everything is a number. And so, although it's an operator in quantum mechanics, it turns out to be just a number here. Still, it's, it, 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 the sense in which it really is an operator is that we integrate over all, we path integrate over all x's. And, um, in fact, I suppressed the path integral. I didn't even write it down, did I? All right, I skipped it. <laughs> anyway, we path integrate over all that, all, over all paths, of course, that go from zero to some point here with the detector. And um, it's the path integration over the classical variables that promotes the classical variable to be a quantum variable. All right, so, so much for that. Um, okay, so this is the action. And of course, the first thing we want to do is, well, we notice this is quadratic, so we relax. This, this is an easy problem because it's quadratic. And um, so the first thing we do is say, well, we want the, um, the, we want to find the classical solution. And of course, we know what the classical solution is. I mean, I could uh, t tell you here we have to um, uh, solve for it. But a Q, Q of t is actually Q prime cosine omega t plus q dot zero sine omega t over omega. But now, um, so this obviously for t equals zero, it is um, uh, it is q prime, and so that's good. And what we want is this thing to be q double prime when uh, this t prime is t, so maybe I should call this t prime. Um, anyway, we know what this, this thing is, and um, in fact, uh, I actually assigned that as a problem in this book, so let me tell you what the action is. S classical, or S of, Q classical here is m omega over 2 sine omega t, and it's q prime squared plus q double prime squared times cosine of omega t minus 2 q prime q double prime. All this is in the numerator here. So that's what the classical action is. Um, so it, it requires a little bit of integration and um, so forth to work that out. And so we know then that the total path integral is going to be, um, we can say that this total path integral then is e to the i s of q classical times an integral over all of the loop fields and or the loop uh, paths and those are just going to create something we'll call L of T. So that's um, that's what uh, the the answer is. Now we could just say well this is L of T and we could uh, leap to the answer by once again Floating on the good ship Dirac, we could um, just pull out another delta function, and that would, in fact, be the correct uh, correct result. Um, and um, you know, I'm thinking maybe the sen sensible thing is just to do that rather than. Um, well, let's see. Is it easier to do that? Well, let me just follow the notes. Um, let's actually compute what this is. Since it is a quadratic problem, we can actually do this. All right, so first of all, what is this arbitrary path? So it's a loop path. 
So we can write it as a sum, j equals 1 to n minus 1, of some arbitrary coefficient sine of j pi t prime over t. Now, what do we have here? What we have here is something that for t prime equal to 0 is 0, and for t prime equal to t is also 0 because j is always an integer. Okay. So this is a suitable loop path, and since we're summing over all, all well, if we, let, if we go to infinity here, and in fact, we can even go to minus infinity, I think. So if we go from minus infinity to plus infinity, we have an arbitrary uh, loop path. So effectively, computing this loop integration, this path integral over the loops, what that means is we basically do an integration over all possible real AJs. Okay. But there is a little problem here because we have to compute what the action of that is. Okay. So um, I assigned this also to make some sense. So what is the action of an arbitrary loop? Well, of a loop of, here I went from j equals 1 to n minus 1. I, I think I could have gone from minus infinity to plus infinity. Anyway, mt over 4, it's um, aj squared. And then the actual number here is j pi squared over t squared minus omega squared. So in other words, you could just compute this. And um, if that's that, then the actual uh, loop integral, so it's e to the i s of delta q, d delta q, well, we're supposed to be doing d delta q, and what we're actually going to be doing is daj, and so there's Jacobian. Don't know what it is. J. <laughs> okay. All right, so then we have nm over 2 pi i t to the n over 2, integral e to the sum I m t over 4, sum j equals 1 to n minus 1, a j squared j pi over t squared minus omega squared, and then we're integrating uh, d a 1 d a n minus 1. Okay, well, this is, yeah. How do you know that Jacobian's a constant? Well, it's, it's a derivative of here. It's, it's a partial of Q with respect to AJ. So with respect to the AJ integrations, it's a constant. It's not a function of the A's. That's what I mean. But good question. Do you want another candy? No, thank you. So it's still a function of time now. Yeah, I, it, it could be quite complicated. That's why I just punted. Okay. All right. So then um, we can rewrite it as ditto product j equals 1 to n minus 1, integral minus infinity to plus infinity e to the i mt over 4 aj squared times uh, j pi over t squared minus omega squared dAj. So that's what we actually have. And um, now, if we do this Gaussian integral, which we know how to do, and um, aha. There's also an infinite product formula, formula that I use, and um, unfortunately I didn't write it down here, so I'll just have to quote you the, quote the result. The idea is, I let me say there are these inf, there are certain infinite product formulas. I don't really know how many there are. I haven't counted four of them. 
thought they were so nice I stuck them in my book. But um, presumably there are many more. And they're all kind of magical, I think. Because um, if we, and they must be really related to path integrals, um, because path integral is an infinite product in a sense. Um, now, we're familiar from college math courses for familiar with infinite series, and the idea is basically, you know, the, you have this plus another one plus another one plus another one, each one is small, so it's just a tiny chain. Whereas with an infinite product, um, I suppose if you're multiplying things that are very close to one, then you can say, well, there's hardly any change as you keep, and you can, but I don't know, it, 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 they actually strike me as being rather, rather puzzling. In any event, what you can do is you can show that this thing is actually the square root of m omega, using one of the infinite product formulas, 2 pi i sine omega t. It's uh, the infinite product formula is 4.140, so it's that equation chapter. Equation 140, Chapter 4 of my book. I didn't write it down here. I didn't bring the book. And it's then times the limit as n goes to infinity of the Jacobian times n to the n over 2 product j equals 1 to n minus 1 of square root of 2 over j pi. So it's this, this huge thing here. And Just wondering, that's almost saying that this J is time independent. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not quite sure about uh, the constancy of Well, the yeah, 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 right. Yeah. But um, anyway, this is basically <coughs> true. And, and wh what happens then is we get this, this amplitude is 2 double prime e to the minus i t h by putting in an h bar and q prime, this is then this square root, namely m omega over 2 pi i h bar sine omega t. It's this times basically the classical action, which is e to the i m omega, and then q prime squared plus q double prime squared uh, post omega t minus 2 q prime q double prime, all of that uh, divided by 2 h bar sine omega t. Okay, so that's the amplitude. Um, well, when you look at it, uh, you know, who'd have thought that um, the oscillator was that complicated? It is. Um, uh, any questions? Oh goodness, I just got a message that's important. Um, uh, all right, let, we, we, we have to take a break now for you guys to fill out these forms. Um, I will get some.
That's the probability of going from one spot to another. Okay, so we'll square it. That's a problem. Maybe try. But should we do the same thing? Just like a short jerk equation? Yeah. Have no fear. Yeah. Work out. Institution. Mental. <laughs> <laughs> Does it seem like it would? You just, I don't know, think about it. Think about it. Quite bad. <clears throat> Both of these guys. And just put them hard. Yeah. How about I ask with pause names? Right, the question is, yeah. there's, no, there's no key here.